We are at Jesus' Lord Ministries, and I, we're in a teaching series entitled, Your True Identity, Who I Am in Christ. And every week, the Lord reminds me to say what week it is. This is week 32 of an ongoing teaching, because we are called to seek ye first the kingdom of God, and to seek God's presence and that's what we do, and, and that is to seek after Jesus, so we want to know who he is. But when I came into the sanctuary tonight, I was looking behind me, and it's interesting because there's a banner that says, Fresh Fire, and underneath it, it says, Go into all the world, and then it says, Jesus is Lord. And that's kind of what we need to do every day as a believer. Get fresh fire, get filled up. Then we go out in the world, and what should be coming out of our mouth is we should be witnesses for Jesus. So we're in week 32, and we always want to open up the Word of God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, and by the free speech in this land that was created on this country, created on godly principles, we still have the privilege to stand up and speak about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who did not come to condemn the world, but came to save it, that those that heard the message and believed might, might be saved. So we thank you for that privilege, Lord. We know that when your word goes forth, it will not return void. We ask you to bless this message, Lord, and let these words be yours that go forth and let us not leave tonight the same as we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I was looking today at the Lord, what we call the Lord's Prayer, and uh, it, it is an interesting set of scriptures when Jesus was asked, Lord, how do we pray? And he opened up by praising God, our Father. He, he speaks to the paternal side of God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, God, you're higher than us, and you're holy. And then thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So I would challenge everybody when they get in their quiet time, ask, ask what that means, thy kingdom come. But that's not, that's not part of this message. It's a little bit related. We're, we're, we took a shift, we're learning who Jesus is, but two weeks ago we shifted into the will of God. Knowing God's will and doing God's will, they're two separate things. In the book of James, we heard that we have to be doers of the word. So not only do we need to find out what God's will is, but we have to do what his will is for us. And the more that I go out into the world and listen to people, I hear people speaking about the will of God, and, and, it, and it's, it's kind of a, in a different context. The Bible is the will of God. He gives, us, he, he, he gives us the answers to all of life's questions. Now, why would God do that? Why do we need to know His will? It's because he created us to be in his image and after his likeness. So if we don't know what pleases God, what's good in God's eyes, what's bad in God's eyes, what are the consequences of our actions in God's eyes, uh, what does it mean, the condition of our heart, for example? The Bible speaks about the heart many times. So we can't walk. Uh, the heart is important in our walk with, with Jesus. So we have to understand what God's will is. Tied to that, I kept seeing scriptures as I would look up scripture after scripture, precept upon precept of God's will. They seem to be tied to many scriptures that speak on false doctrines and false teachers. And in a really short time of research, I came up with a list of a hundred scriptures that speak on false doctrines and 100 that speak on false teachers. Now some of those scriptures overlap because it's going to tell you that there's a false doctrine being done by a teacher. But you can't speak about the will of God or learn about the will of God without knowing what isn't God's will as well. So they're, they're actually related. They may seem like 
separate subjects, but they're tied together. And we're going to look at a couple scriptures on that today. We're going to dwell on this topic for a while because it's important. There's a lot of false doctrines going through in the body of Christ and the closer that I get to God, the more revelation that I get from Him, uh, the more that I, I hear, be quick to hear and slow to speak, I can hear what is coming out of someone's mouth, whether it's a, a person of the world or somebody that is a believer that, or, or someone that attends church regularly. Uh, and you hear a lot of convoluted information. You'll hear a statement that's part, that, that starts out to be true, and then it finishes with, with a misunderstanding of something. And that could, it could be their misunderstanding. It could be ignorance, which is a lack of knowledge. I'm not using that word to be critical of anybody, but... Uh, I myself am an ignorant man when I, uh, with, regarding auto mechanics because I don't have knowledge of it. I, I, that's not something that I, I have a passion for to study. Uh, right now, I, I'm kind of single-minded with my, uh, what I'm passionate about, which means that I don't have a lot of people that want to hang around me right now because they don't want to hear about my passion. <laughs> and that's Jesus. And I'm okay with that. You have a personal relationship with God and you won't worry about what other people think because you're walking and talking with God all day long, whether that be in prayer or whatever. How we talk to him is important. That's another reason why we need to know what God's will is. So before I get into some scriptures, I'm going to challenge you with some definitions uh, and and I, I did say last week that some of these messages are going to be hard. People aren't going to want to hear them. Uh, and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm going to give you some personal testimonies of myself, things that God spoke to me when he corrected me on some things so that I can't be accused of that. And then I'm going to give you the scripture. But last week we looked at the definition of character. And I read that a few times. I wanna, I'm going to read that again. This is the definition of character. Remember, we're speaking about the will of God. The peculiar qualities. Peculiar qualities. So what, what would that be? That would be attributes of somebody, character traits, their nature, what we refer to sometimes as their nature or their personality traits. So the peculiar qualities impressed by nature or habit, Pastor Mike preached on this, habit, repetition, repetition becomes habit. So your qualities that you have that make up your character are a byproduct of what is either in your nature right now or that you're allowing in by habit or repetition. On a person, those that which distinguish him from others. So that's what your character is. These constitute real character. And the qualities which he or she is supposed to possess, and I, I, I wrote in my notes in parentheses, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, constitute his or her estimated character or their estimated reputation. So God created us in his image after his likeness, but do, do we, if we honestly ask ourselves, even someone that doesn't know God, that's a non-believer, I doubt that very many people, if you would say to them, do you look like God or do you behave like God? That they would, many people, before I was a believer, I would have said no to that question. So there's real character and there's the character that you're supposed to possess. It kind of sounds to me when I read this definition that there's, there's Peter Yanata's character his personality of who he is today, 
and then who he's supposed to be. Now, I don't look like God right now. None of us will until we come home and we see Jesus for who he really is. However, there is a blueprint throughout the Bible on what my personality is supposed to look like. And if I'm not open-minded enough, and we're, we're going to get to this, it, it's called the renewing of your mind. We're going to look in a, in a few minutes, when I looked at different sites to see scriptures on the will of God, person after person after person that put lists together that I was focusing on that single topic went out to the body of Christ and asked them to give them a scripture on these topics. And it's interesting, the number one by far scripture that multiple people that, that, that asked this question got the same answer. And we're going to take a look at that. has to do with the will of God being the renewing of your mind. We speak about that. We preach about that. We hear about that over and over and over and yet, there's many, many people who have not got the revelation of what that really means yet. Because until you see that, you're going to hear it. And like the secular world says, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. Or like Jesus said, let those with the ears that have ears to hear, hear the message that I'm going to give them. So I'm going to give you some definitions real quick before we get into the scripture because I, I want, I, I believe that we're being challenged by God to look at our character in these days. We hear about repentance. Well, what am I supposed to repent of? I can say my sin nature, but what all is that that I'm doing that I already know about and I still continue in and why do I need to break away from that? So, character, the peculiar qualities impressed by nature or habit on a, per on a person. Character traits on a person which distinguish him from others. These are your real character and then the qualities which you're supposed to possess but you haven't yet. Wow, that sounds like I need to approach my walk with God with fear and trembling and just because I said a prayer doesn't mean that I've arrived at where I'm supposed to be. I think there's a word called sanctification that this is an ongoing process that I'm supposed to possess. Those things constitute your estimated character. So, wow, Noah Webster in 1828, a man that said, I, I'm not going to write a Bible unless I, or a, a dictionary unless I could introduce Scripture into it because knowledge, learning without the Bible is useless, defined character in his dictionary, and yet you could go and find the Scripture to back all this up. But you have to press into God enough and learn what God's will is, what His commandments are, what His precepts are, what is His law. You have to be open-minded and look at that and evaluate yourself. Examine your heart, God calls it, to be able to want to change. Because our character that we have versus the one that we're supposed to have is what we spoke about two weeks ago. This is a war between the spirit and the flesh. It's the spirit that's now in you if you're a believer versus the world, the flesh. So you have an estimated character or a reputation now, I, I, my secular job is in the construction industry. And at one time in my life, my job responsibilities were to be to do estimates. So I could look at a blueprint, look at the concrete footers, and I could estimate how much concrete that's supposed to take to pour that 
versus what the reality of it is that will, will happen later. So there is a difference between real and estimated in your character as well. Hence we say a character is not formed when the person has not acquired stable and distinctive qualities. Now we're looking at shortly Galatians 5 where we get God's will, his definition of what this estimated character is supposed to look like in us. So if it's an estimated character that I haven't arrived yet, that tells me even without going into the Bible right yet and giving you scripture that I've not arrived at something and I need to know what that mark is. Well, it's, it's to look at Jesus. And, and we have that information at our fingertips. So before we get into Galatians 5, remember we spoke about the spirit and the flesh. They war against one another. They prick against one another. So really what is happening? It's the character of God, the mind of Christ, through the spirit now in you that you're supposed to try to, you're estimated to become like versus your existing flesh or the, the worldly principles. And again, there are scriptures that say uh, a person of the spirit speaks of things of the spirit and one of the world is going to speak of the world. So when I leave my house, I could tell just by listening to somebody I'm going to say where they're at spiritually because just because they're speaking on the world doesn't mean they're a believer yet, uh, or they could be, but that's, that's, all their, that, that's what's on their heart right now. They're, 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 just, they're speaking of worldly things. The character of God, the mind of Christ, this is important because of that scripture that, that we're leading up to for the will of God. What is God's will for us? Well, we know in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we have to be made into something. We also know that God is the potter and we're the clay. We're supposed to be conformed and transformed. So there's... there's evidence biblically that we aren't supposed to stop letting God transform us and we should at the very least if we fight against this whole process if we could just get the fact in our heads and in our heart that God wants us to be like him and he sent Jesus Christ as the physical example for us to look at to listen to and see what we're supposed to be like, if we could just get that first, we should, we should be able to come to the logical conclusion based on that one revelation that this is an ongoing process and I'm not supposed to stop today. Smith Wigglesworth said if he's not further along in his walk at the end of the day, he's in a backslidden condition. I heard that one day and I didn't, that hit me so hard one day, I didn't have to even go look up the scripture to back it up. I, uh, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit flooded me once, once I was open to listen to that and receive it. God's spirit within me revealed scriptures to back it up. He convicted me immediately on that. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is the scripture we're going to look at shortly. But before we get finished with these definitions, I want you to remember the definition of character starts out. The peculiar qualities. And we spoke about this scripture several weeks ago. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
So we're peculiar people. We dissected this scripture several weeks ago, so I'm not going to reiterate what each of these means in, in the Greek in the context, and in the context that, that it was written. But we see in Scripture the same word used that is used in the definition of your character. And again, you have a real character and you have an estimated character or what, you're, what, what your real character is, is who am I today? P who, who, what does Peter Yanata look like today versus the mark. Well, Jesus is my mark. That frightens me every day when I get up. That's a fear of the Lord that drives me because I know and got the revelation that God's will is for me to look like Jesus, to think like him, to have the mind of Christ, to behave like him, and to talk like him. That's what I have to look like. So if I'm honest with myself and I evaluate myself and examine my heart before I fall asleep each day and say to myself, self, are you more like yourself or are you more like Jesus today? And if I'm honest, I'm going to have I'm going to have my work cut out for me when the morning starts, when the sun comes up. You know, but Here's the thing, and I, I can only speak personally with me, with myself. When I do that, and that conviction hits me, it's my perspective, and we're going to talk, that's a definition we're going to look at soon. My perspective on what's happening is because God is faithful, and He's good, and He wants good for me. His correction is doing nothing more in my heart than leading me closer to what I'm supposed to be like. For me to be able to seek the kingdom of God first and for him to transform me. So it's not a bad thing. So my walk with God, and this happens a lot in my, my two-hour commute one way each day, it's correction, it's correction. It's correction, but he does it in a way that I can receive it. He works with me where I'm at. Sometimes what he tells me today, he will give me another part of Friday, give me another part Saturday, and another part Monday, and then all of a sudden the light comes on, and, and, I, and I go, oh, that's what you were trying to do. Why didn't you just tell me that up front? Well, you weren't ready to hear what I had to tell you. <laughs> It's like, like somebody said once, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, that's how God corrects me. He leads me to where I need to go until I get the revelation. So for me personally, it's really important for me to not allow things in my eye gate or in my ear gate that will detract from me hearing God because when he's speaking to me, he's trying to get me to go somewhere and do something. And he's trying to get me closer to my estimated character, which he defined in his Bible. That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness. We should be praising and worshiping God. And this is another topic, but... If you look at the Lord's Prayer and dissect that line by line, it doesn't start out, Oh God, I need this today, I need that. It starts out with praise, 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 praise. Then you can ask God, and then you close with praise. So our petition is sandwiched between praising God. So as an example... When I leave my house and I get in the car, it takes me about 10 minutes in my drive to go through this routine of, you know, uh, okay, the, the rear view mirror is right. All, all the little distractions that can happen before I focus on God, I, I get cleared out. And the first thing that I do is put worship music on and I start to sing to God. 
Now, when he speaks back to me, he could be speaking back to me in this song that I'm singing, or the song is putting me at a, in a place spiritually where I'm welcoming in his presence. And that's really what I'm trying to do, because when I'm in that state is when I'm the most receptive to hearing his voice, because he's speaking to me all the time. But if I can get there before I get to work, I'm positioned over two hours to allow that to happen, the fresh fire or the infill to happen within me, and then I'm, I'm set up. I, uh, I've, got, I've got the six bullets in my six-shooter that I need to get through what's going to come at me uh, during the day so that I, I, as these things come my way, they can glance off my armor, they can bounce off me, and I don't start to look more like me and less like Jesus. Now, I, I can tell you this. When I am on my way home sometimes, or I'm going from work, and there's days where it's an all-out war, before I walk in the door, and, and I'm going to let my family come at me because they're happy to see me, there's times where I know I have to use wisdom and I know to just let my day get off of me so that I'm better prepared and I, I, don't, I don't look at that in a negative perspective. So we're a peculiar people. When you can get yourself in that place where you're receptive to the presence of God and you start to pray... What happens to me is when I open my mouth and, and I start to say, I use the Lord's Prayer, and I get criticized by this people all the time. Oh, you've got a religious spirit. You've got to get creative with your prayers. Well, Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. He gave me the outline, and that's the outline that I'm going to use. Our Father... When I'm in my vehicle and I get into the Spirit, as soon as that comes out of my mouth, I cannot help but smile and joy hits me. It, it, because I'm in the presence of God. Or if I just start yelling out. This morning I was driving and I just started to yell, Jesus! I wasn't asking Him for anything. I just kept yelling that name out and about the third time I said that, a big smile hit me and joy hit me just from saying his name. You know, we, we a lot of times when we look at the authority and the power of the name of Jesus, our mind wants to go to cast out demons and stuff. Well, what if we, when we pray, we actually, or worship God, we do what Jesus said and we worship him in spirit and truth and then we just start calling his name out and joy hits us. And that you think the devil wants to hang around you when you're, doing, when you're in that place? There's days where I get there and I'll start laughing at the devil. I'll say, devil, I'm just going to sing a little louder. If you want to hang around and hear me keep repeating the name of Jesus, that's okay. But it, it, it just becomes more of a habit to do. Repetition. So how does all this really look? You have to get two scriptures in your heart so deep that whatever you look at in the Bible and whatever you read thereafter is going to tell you whether that's false information or not. The first thing you have to get the revelation of is is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now Paul's writing to his protege, he's training Timothy, and he's t teaching him how to be a pastor. This is part of the pastoral teachings of Paul. Verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Well, what does that mean? 
We already looked at the definition of righteousness, but in perspective, again, we're going to look at the definition of perspective of today's message. What does that mean? It means for instruction in your estimated character versus your real character that you exhibit today and that the world sees. So you have to believe in your heart that everything that's written in the Bible is the truth. That what Jesus said is true. If you don't believe that, then you're, you're not going to make it on that long and narrow road. And you're going to position yourself in a place where you're going to hear something that is going to justify your lack of belief, your unbelief, and your flesh is going to say, there's the proof I need for what I really want to do in my flesh. So I think I'll stay in my real character and, and dismiss this thing about an estimated character or what I'm supposed to look like versus who I am today. The second scripture that ties into the message today, equally important, is found in the book of Acts in chapter 17. This is Paul and Silas at Berea, and we've heard this before, and let's just think about what this means. So if Peter Yanata decided in his walk that no matter what the Bible says is the truth, this should be the very next thing that I do. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they went to teach. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they, and listen to this, this is God's words, in that they received the word, Remember the parable of the seed sower and what happens to different people. They received the word with all readiness of mind. They were ready. In their mind, they wanted to learn. They had a goal. They had expectations. They received the word and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So just because it was Apostle Paul... They, they had to go confirm that what they heard was the truth. Now, how many people behind the pulpit would get offended today if somebody sitting back in a chair heard a message and came up and said, I'm not sure that's really the truth. Or at least they had that question and then they went back and researched it. Now, why would, that, why, why would that be that way? Well, if I believe that everything in the Bible is the truth, and I'm hearing somebody speak in a Bible study or preaching the Word of God, I really better make sure I am anyway that what I'm hearing is the truth. Now, how do I do that? Well, you've got to meditate on the Word of God, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. I can't get done everything in my day that I start out to get done, except I know that I can do all things in Christ, and I can turn to God and say, God, I've got to be at three places today in two and a half hours, and geographically I can't do that. Can you make me diligent and efficient in my work so I can accomplish everything that I need to do for my employer today? Because I want to teach the Word of God. I want to get home and have time to prepare. Do you think he's not going to honor that? My motive, my perspective is right, and my motive is, is good. That was the King James Version. Now this is, I like this, this is another version of the Bible. Same verse. Now these Jews were better disposed and more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they were entirely ready and accepted and welcomed the message. 
con- con- now listen to this, concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. That's the message that they're eager to hear. With inclination of mind and eagerness, searching and examining the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. So it is God's will for me, for all of us, to search his word. We have to do that. We, what do you think meditate on the word means or Bible study? We should be studying in a Bible study what God's word is, not someone's opinion or not another subject. There's times when I've taught classes that, that I've, I've had to, uh, and, and I, you know, I'm going to be led by the Spirit with this, but, but I've had to shut people down. Sometimes they get mad, and sometimes you have to ask them to leave the class. They're, they're not really, the class isn't really for them, they're just argumentative. Um, I had a family member attack me at dinner one night the first time I went to Africa. I mean viciously, but when I look back at, at, and and I'm not judging him, but listening to what was saying, there was a lot of pride and arrogance, and this was the kind of person that had to be the center of attention. So for somebody else to not let them speak, number one, because I'm all excited and passionate, and then my topic is Jesus Christ, it, 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 it it, 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 it pricked against him. So, I'm there doing what I'm commanded to do. I'm actually answering a question that my cousin had for me, who was very receptive to listening to, to the topic of conversation, which someone else tried to shut down, <clears throat> and yet, when they were accusing me of, of certain things, and then they said, boy, I wish I would be in your class. I'd, I'd set that class straight. And I said, well, actually, I would dismiss you from the class. And, and they got even more offended. And he said, how could you do that? And I said, first of all, you wouldn't have taken the class if you looked at the syllabus at the topic. That wouldn't have been an interest to you. For, for you to sit here and attack me at the subject matter, I can clearly tell you right now, you, you wouldn't have taken that class. Second of all, the class is always full of people that want to hear this. And because of that, I would give you an opportunity to speak and then probably have to say, look, you, we can continue this discussion briefly, briefly, briefly after class, but not here in the classroom. This is not the platform for you to, to voice your attack. So we have to know the Word. The more Word that you study and the more Word that you get in your heart and the more that you let the Holy Spirit move on that Word of God, the less time you have to go and do certain things. Soon you'll be sitting there and as you're hearing the message eagerly and your expectation is God's going to give you something and He's going to move on you, because your perspective and your attitude are now right, and you got the word in you, you now know that what you're hearing is true, and there's parts of what you just heard you don't have to go back and confirm. You just got confirmation right there because your attitude and your perspective are right, and your character, you're open-minded to having a renewed mind, to getting closer to your estimated character versus the real character that you exhibit today. So character is important. Now I want to look at something, the condition of the heart. Your condition of your heart, that's a term that we hear in the body of Christ, and God speaks about the heart over and over and over again. The condition of your heart is related to your attitude, contentment, How content are you and your perspective? And we're going to look at some secular definitions and then we're going to go look at scriptures on these. 
your attitude has and is related to that real character. It's who you are today. So, is your attitude positive or negative? Is your attitude tied to a positive perspective? The world would say, do you look at the world through a, a, a glass of water? Do you see it half empty or do you see it half full? I used to tell myself when someone would say that, or somebody would say to me, wow, you're always positive. You look at the world from a glass that's full, half full all the time. Today, because I'm so far away from the mark of my estimated character to look like Jesus, I would acknowledge that my glass isn't full yet. And, and I got to press towards that mark. So there's my perspective started out one way, went to another, and then I went back and, and reevaluated where I was based on the will of God. What does God want me to be? What is that estimated character that I'm supposed to be? Your attitude is directly related to your well-being, your wellness, your wholeness. It's what allows you to hear God clearly. If I'm grumbling, if I'm complaining to God, and I'm doing all the talking when I'm driving in my two hours to work, I, I, I sometimes I, I, when I find myself and I catch myself starting to do that, what I do is I apologize to God and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been asking you some questions for a couple days and I bet you gave me the answer. <laughs> and I hate when people ask me to repeat myself, but I'm going to ask you, please have mercy on me and, and repeat no matter how many times you were trying to tell me that now because I'm ready, God. I'm sorry. So your attitude is important. That's part of your character. How does the world look at you and what do they see in your attitude? Are you somebody that they want to get close to and listen to what they have to say? Or are you somebody that wants to walk in and do all the talking and everything coming out of your mouth is how bad a day you had? Because I can tell you, I don't want to listen to that all the time. So I'm going to, I'm going to want to gravitate and get, get into a quiet place. Contentment. The word content, what does that definition mean? I would say, this is not part of the definition, but, but I would say that a bad attitude would be like cancer in your walk with God. It would block you from hearing God, and it would keep you in, in that real character that was away from God, versus your estimated character to get closer to him. And I would say contentment, or to be content, that, that part of your character, if you're, if you're content with things, whether you have or you have not, like Paul writes, that's going to breed in your heart thankfulness. You're going to thank God and praise Him every time something happens. When I first went to Africa and I got in the car with uh, David Chuma and we started to drive, I actually had to repent. It was a year later when God reminded me of this, but there were some things that I wanted to ask him and I never got the opportunity. And I started to, I started to think, man, he's, he's just, he won't let me talk. Why is that? Well, what God showed me, he asked me one day, when you're with Pastor Chuma, what is he, when he's talking all the time, what is he doing? And I had to go back and I'm thinking, wow, I'm really sorry, God. All I hear out of his mouth is, praise Jesus, praise the Lord, that light just turned. Praise the Lord, they filled those potholes. Praise the Lord, there's no traffic today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And here I am sitting there thinking, this guy won't let me say anything. I want to talk. Well, I like being around somebody like that today where I don't have to talk. And I'm learning, wow, that, that's a thankful heart. That guy's content. 
So what is the definition of contentment and how does that relate to your estimated character? Being content, now listen to this, is a resting or satisfaction of mind, whether you have or have not. It's a resting place. So, I'm supposed to rest up, maybe, and then I can fly like an eagle, right? That means I must have to be content with whatever my day looks like. Contentment, a resting, a satisfaction of your mind without external honor attached to it, is humility. And we're going to see that in a little bit. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit, meekness, humility. What does God say about that? Godliness, that estimated character that we're talking about, that we're not there yet because we're, having, we're, we're still living in our real character, godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Godliness, God's character, God's attributes, God's personality that you're supposed to have with contentment. Righteousness with contentment is great gain. So I would say that where being content or contentment would breed a heart that wants to explode in warmth and love and compassion and thankfulness, malcontent, the opposite of that, is going to breed complaining. So where's your character on for your real character versus that estimated character? And then the second part of that definition of contentment is gratitude. Are you grateful? Do you experience, what happens when you get up in the morning? Are you looking forward to your day? It's, they all have challenges. We know we're in a spiritual war. But how, how do you view, how do you start out? You know, when I get in the shower, one of the only songs I know a lot of the verses to is Amazing Grace. That song, when I started to learn that, it moved me and brought me to my knees because it happened at the same time I saw Christ on the cross. And I wanted to study that song. So I, I knew, you know, I learned the first six verses of that. So I sing that in the shower a lot of times. It, it starts to put me in, in a place of contentment. And it brings me closer to when I get ready to get in my car to get in that place where God is so real, He's right there. And there's been days where that's occurred to me where I actually clean off the, the passenger seat, which is my desk. And, and I'll say, God, I'm sorry, I didn't really leave you enough room there to, to be here. Now, God, you know, <laughs> it's probably laughing at me, but, but it's, a, it's a good joke. So gratitude and contentment, contentment can lead to meekness without wanting external honor on it. There's a, a um, it was a TV series done, I believe, in 2017 that they put in eight, season one is eight episodes called The Chosen. And every now and then I'll put that on and I'll watch it a couple times during the week. Um, I, I like to look at some of the scriptures that they give. You're, you can listen to the scripture, but they're giving you a view of how that may have looked like. And there's a couple of them that are really good. When, when Mary got delivered, and Nicodemus is searching to find out how this happened, uh, there's two different people in a short period in these episodes that make the comment, you mean he does, this man does miracles, but he doesn't seek the credit for it? 
And that's what, this, that's what this definition is saying. Humility is meekness. It's contentment. It's resting or satisfaction of mind without external honor. So the mind of Christ without external honor is our definition as a believer of what humility is. You know, people ask me all the time, I look at the fruit of the Spirit and what does meekness mean? There's your definition. It's contentment. It's the mind of Christ without external honor. With the, you're gonna do. You're gonna look like. You're gonna think like Jesus, speak like Jesus, and walk in the shoes of Jesus, and be so full of the Spirit that signs, wonders, and miracles are gonna follow because it's just the Word coming out of you. But you're not gonna take any external honor for that. That's Christ. That's who we're supposed to look like. So I look at the will of God and I see the Holy Bible, which is the truth and the Spirit of God that can move on me in the truth. And then I look at the opposite of that, which is the way to destruction, whatever you want to call that. And that's where the will of God gets tied into false doctrines and false teachings, because that is the way to your destruction. And if you get caught up wanting to follow something that is not of God, it sounds good. Boy, there's a half a scripture there, you know. And, and, I, and I, I'm, I'll give you an example, the challenge. Go read Psalm 1. There's six verses. Look at the first three. And is that what you hear, but you don't hear what happens to, in verse 4, 5, and 6? Because there is conditions on those blessed, that blessed person that God talks about. So if somebody, and I've been at places where I've heard somebody start to speak, and then they put a scripture up, and then they continue to speak on that, and something doesn't seem right in my spirit, and I'm thinking, I don't know about that. Well, what's happening in me? I, I want to, I'm going to take the second part of what I want as repetition or habit in me. And that is, I, I believe that everything God says is truth. I want to look at the content and I want to be a Berean saint and go and confirm because that, that didn't, something's not right there. It doesn't feel good. And that's why we have to do that. If, if the will of God is in the Bible, we have to not be teaching just a part of God's will and saying, this is God's will for you. It's this part that you're blessed. Well, what do I need to do? First of all, I would say, what does that word really mean? Blessing. Jesus speaks about that. We've been given all the blessings in heavenly places. I bet... And I don't bet anymore, but I would, I would, I would use an, an old term. If I was a betting man, I would say that that's not part of the estimated character that I'm supposed to look like if I'm only willing to absorb half of God's word because that's what feels good to me and the other part doesn't. If my heart is in the right place, the condition of my heart and that will breed contentment, I am going to be more likely to receive God's correction through His Word like we saw in the Scripture when He wrote to Timothy. So we're not going to get into Galatians 5 today, but I want to I read another definition to you uh, because this is really what a false doctrine is. It's a placebo. And many of us know kind of what that means. But, but I want to read this to you because it's three lengthy paragraphs, believe it or not. So we look at the definition of contentment and we see that it's one sentence and then parts added to it. Now look at placebo because if you're, if you're listening... And taking in, remember what, they, what Paul said about the Bereans, they were anxious. They received the word eagerly, and then they went and confirmed that what they heard was truth. 
These people are grounded in good soil. They're not the ones that got excited when they heard the word and it fell on the rocks. And even if, it, if, there's, if there's weeds in their garden, they're at least willing to go back because it doesn't say that this wasn't a true statement. They wanted to confirm it. So possibly they got convicted. Wow, I'm not doing that. Let me go back and make sure that this is of God because if it is, that's the truth and I need to change my behavior. Placebo is a substance... Where do we hear that word before? In Hebrews 11, it's God's definition of faith uses that word. Faith is a substance. It's a real thing. So a placebo, we're going to see, is real, but it's a fake thing. It's a fantasy. Placebo is a substance or treatment which is designed, designed, to have no therapeutic value. It's a treatment that by design has no therapeutic value. A false doctrine has no therapeutic value. What it does is will lead you to destruction. And when you open that door to the devil, with one false doctrine or part of it, if you don't become a Berean saint every time you hear something and go back and test the spirits, those are some, these are some, I'm giving you some scriptures that we're going to look at in the next few weeks. The terms that God uses, His words. You don't test the spirits, you're opening a door that's going to lead or it could lead to destruction. My personal view, how I approach this, I, I want to I, I wanna go and get closer to the estimate of what I'm supposed to be, not live in the real of where I'm at today. Common placebos include inner tablets like sugar pills, inner injections like saline, sham surgery, and other procedures. In general, placebos... Now, when I read this, I want, you to, I want you to replace the word that you hear placebo with a false doctrine. In general, placebos can affect how patients perceive your perception, their condition, and encourage the body's chemical processes for relieving pain and a few other symptoms. But... They have no impact on the disease itself. It's your imagination. Paul spoke about that. You've got to cast down strongholds in every imagination. So, again, what's your real character and what's your, what's your uh, estimated character that you're moving to? So, you can hear a false doctrine... And it can sound good, but it has no impact on the disease. So just that one sentence alone. If I accept the false doctrine that once I said that prayer, that I could live forevermore on this earth in my real character, and that I absolutely had no responsibility to take for myself to move towards the estimated character of God's will. I feel good. The symptom went away because I convinced myself that that's the truth. But the disease, the sin nature that's going to condemn me to the fire pit of hell is still there. And I'm walking towards it. I'm getting ever closer to that. And the devil's smiling thinking, there you go. I, I got in. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start feeding more on that one false doctrine. I'm going to build on that. Just like precept must be upon precept. We're going to talk about this in the, in the future because you got the Spirit of God and you got an, there's an Antichrist spirit. And we're going to look at a scripture, what God says that is. 
It's anything in the Bible that you don't accept as the truth means you have an antichrist spirit. But that's for later. Improvements that patients experience after being treated with a placebo can also be due to unrelated factors such as regression to the mean or a natural recovery from the illness. I would rather walk in fear that God's word is truth than regress back to the mean being my real character versus where I'm supposed to get to on that estimated character we looked at in that definition. Or like Smith Wigglesworth said, I now allowed myself maybe by a false doctrine or even an, uh, an external means to be in a backslidden condition. What does that mean? It means I went backwards to get to the mark of what my character is supposed to look like. The use of placebos in clinical medicines raises ethical concerns. Wow. God speaks about our moral character. So a placebo of a false doctrine, shouldn't that raise in the body of Christ concerns about our ethical and moral condition, the condition of our heart now? Especially if they are disguised as an active treatment, as this introduces dishonesty into the doctor-patient relationship and bypasses informed consent. So dishonesty now came in through the placebo. While it was once assumed that this deception was necessary for placebos to have any effect, in other words, you've got to be deceived to let your imagination run wild to convince yourself that you're on the right track, there is now evidence that placebos can have effects even when the patient is aware that the treatment is a placebo. Well, I know what the Word of God says, but boy, that really sounds good. It's harder to, to, to do that rather than to just follow my flesh. And that feels better, so I think I'll go the route of the placebo and convince myself that, that that's the right thing to do. The idea of a placebo effect so there's an effect, a cause and effect, a therapeutic outcome derived from an inert treatment, that's what this is, was discussed in 18th century psychology. Wow, that's where your imagination is, and that's exactly what God says you need renewed, renewing of the mind. That is the number one scripture that when you research what is God's will, that shows up time and time and time again. It's the one that shows up the most people say, uh, theologians, that, that that scripture defines God's will. And you'll see things like they're, they're in the order, uh, this, this is people's opinions, like what's the number one in your opinions scripture that talks about God's will? And be not conformed to this world Get rid of those placebos, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So your mind being renewed is linked to God's will. It says so right in that one sentence. An influential 1955 study entitled The Powerful Placebo, powerful false doctrine, powerful false teaching that has no therapeutic value and leads, does not cure the disease but makes you feel good, established, firmly established the idea that placebo effects were clinically important and were a result of the brain's role in physical health. 
I could give you a sugar pill tonight, or I can tell you to meditate on the, God, the word of God. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. I don't need a placebo. I have the truth. I accepted God's word as the truth, and I got that scripture in my heart. So yes, I will be a Berean saint, and the more that I am, I, 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 I'm sorry to say, but I'm not trying to be antisocial, but the more I listen to people preach, the less willing I am to go to a, 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 a conference anymore, where I may hear one person speak the truth, and then I've got to subject myself to eight people that because I'm meditating on the Word of God and I'm not being critical of them, remember, ignorance is a lack of knowledge. If they've accepted this, doesn't mean I have to. And God speaks about this. Will there be any faith left? Placebos and false doctrines. Next week, we are going to talk about and focus on nine scriptures that speak on God's will. And then I'm going to give you the list of the other hundred. There's another, there's a hundred of them that you can focus on. If you're not sure what God's will is and you're busy and you want to, you don't want to go look and do the research, that's part of my job. I have to edify the body of Christ. I'm a teacher of the word of God. I'm not going to give you the placebos. I'm going to give you the scripture. We'll close on that. Father, we thank you for the truth that when we allow you to transform and conform us into the estimated character or your will for what we're to look like and we're willing that we can receive the word of God as the truth. So, Father, I ask you to give us a divine hunger and thirst for righteousness, for the truth, that we focus our eyes, like Jesus said, to be single on him, that we learn the truth, that when we hear people speak or read things that we read that don't line up with the word of God, that the word placebo glares back at us on, on that paper or that we hear and we remember, Jesus, you spoke of parables, metaphors, and examples. Let your truth change us from today forward, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.